In this video, I'm gonna talk about why you can get a higher level of service, a more likely chance of success, uh, climbing large mountains if you run your own expeditions versus going with a established guiding company. Subscribe to the Slow Boat Sailing channel. We give you the secrets of doing outdoor expeditions, right? So I've been organizing outdoor expeditions for many years, mostly for sailing. Uh, I started climbing uh, after the uh, the thing that happened to the world, uh, and I climbed my first uh, 14, 14er, uh, I think back in 2020. And then uh, most of the most of the larger mountains that I've climbed are were totally solo, no guides, no nothing. Uh, but I have paid guiding companies, and I'm going to tell you the big flaws with them, and why you can get most of the services that they offer on their trips. They sell trips. Uh, with a higher chance of success uh, on your own. Okay, so the fundamental problem with guiding companies is maybe it's maybe not their fault, it may be the climber's fault, that there's a lot of climbers out there that think of climbing a mountain as a trip instead of an expedition, right? You've got X number of days off for work, and you're going to do it in this window. That's not compatible with the outdoors. Mother Nature, mountains, weather, have different conditions, and in bad conditions, you will not be able to summit. You have to wait for the good weather, mountain conditions to do that, and there's no way to know that in advance. So booking a trip a month in advance, all you know is the almanac weather for that time, but you, there's no reliable forecast more than 14 days out. Uh, the, so that's the first problem with going with like a big guiding company like Alpine Ascents or RMI or Mountain Madness. And I have nothing against these companies, never used any one of these companies. I listen to their their videos all the time and their seminars. Uh, but I think that, and I look at their and I look at their gear lists. Uh, but I I think that the other real big problem with going with a guided trip that you didn't organize the expedition yourself, you didn't determine uh, the boundaries of the expedition. They just said, hey, we're going to this mountain on these dates. Come along is that it's gonna be with a lot of other people. And, you know, I've been a distance runner since seventh grade, right? And I've never ran a race at the same pace of anybody else, right? So I've run a lot, I've run several marathons, tons of 5Ks, tons of smaller races, climbed a lot of mountains and done a lot of hikes and in all those cases, I never wanted to go the same pace as other people. And I never did. And I never found in two races that I was right next to the same person, right? On a given day, you're just not gonna have the same amount of stamina. Uh, so, and if you add into that, the fact that if you're going to high altitude, that it's not just your fitness, but it's also your reaction to the altitude. So you never know what your body's reaction will be. Even if you do know your body's reaction or what it will be, you will not like going at the same speed as these other people. Uh, so those are the two big ones. And that's why you should organize your own expeditions Either go solo, go with a buddy, go with a guide. Maybe you, you pay for logistics. It may not be cheaper to go on your own. My Pico de Orizaba expedition, it, it, 
I could order the trip. It was actually less expensive, uh, at least in terms of the services I paid for, than had I pre-booked it. But I did. It wasn't about money for me, and there were some things that I did, like driving my car there, my Jeep uh, Wrangler four x four, that were probably more expensive than just flying in, right? So I think you just should think about, and that's in Mexico. I live relatively close to the Mexican border in Louisiana, but not super close. Uh, so uh, might not be the right thing for somebody living in Washington state. They may prefer, they would deal with the hassles of of local transport, etc., not having to be, not being able to switch between their gear, etc. I thought it was quite luxurious to be able to sleep in my Jeep instead of in a hut that was cold and noisy um, prior to Summit Day. I thought that was a big advantage. Being able to charge my devices in my Jeep was a big advantage. So you have to think about those things. And a lot of times with these package trips, they say you can only have this gear weight. There's not a lot of flexibility in terms of like whether or not you use porters or not. Uh, I've been researching the Aconcagua trips. And so Aconcagua, basically all the big guiding companies, I think like Ian Taylor, Alpine Ascents, um, all these others, they're basically going to be outsourcing uh, through, they're going to be doing logistics through probably one of two companies, Grahales or Inca. And you can deal with Grahales and Inca at, at the same, and you will be one of their clients and get access to almost all their services, potentially for a fraction of the fee. But it depends on, you know, what kind of level of service that you want. Like, so do you want porters or not? Uh, you can pay for your porters uh, when you get there, etc. Uh, and you can kind of determine uh, the, the gear that you take at various stages. Now, what are the benefits of having guides? The guides are uh, kind of water boilers for you. So if you're, in, if you're in places where there's not a lot of running water, uh, such as high on a mountain where there's snow, uh, they'll boil water for you. You don't have to worry about stoves. Uh, so that's, a, that's a, a reasonable service they offer. Um, most guys will do if you're not going with the guide. Um, and that's about it. I, I think if you're, if you're not, I mean, if you feel like you're not competent to, to figure out how to go up the mountain, like they, they also offer, they, they know the path, they know the path better than you do. So, that I think is a, a reasonable service, something worth paying for. Um, what I don't think is a reasonable service that they enforce is them telling you to march at a cer certain speed and march in the same speed as everybody else. I think that's a detriment to your success. The fact that the, the acclimatization plan is a one size fits all acclimatization plan, regardless of how you're feeling and regardless of how, you know, what your situation is. Do you live in Bolivia at 12,000 feet? Or do you do you live at sea level, right? Have you pre-acclimatized or have you not pre-acclimatized? A lot of these, these trips, they'll want you to just like, you know, they'll you get off the plane and within 24 hours, you're on their trip, right? And you're probably in their hotel, etc. right? That's the problem with booking trips you don't have any room to do pre-acclimatization if you don't live in Colorado, right? Uh, so uh, it's a it's a big issue, I think, that it's one size fits all. And what does that mean is a lot of people will not be properly acclimatized and will have to go down on a high altitude trip, right? And they won't be able to summit even if the weather window is okay. But the, the other big thing is the determination of the weather window. I don't think guides are very good at risk management. I also think most guides are not well aligned with their client's best interest. Maybe they're aligned with their group's best interest. Maybe not. But uh, the, the attitude that I have seen from guiding companies, if you paid the fee, that's it. They've got your money. And then everything after that, they get to control the schedule regardless of whether 
it's weather okay or whether the weather's okay or not, whether the acclimatization is sufficient or not. Uh, so I just think you need to have a real buyer's beware. So, I mean, I think, for instance, with Aconcagua, um, if you wanted to do that, you go with Grohales or you go with Inca, and then you choose your level of service, and you choose if you how many mules you want to buy. You can also uh, get the mules probably cheaper if you buy them from uh, at uh, at Penitentes, I'm told. Uh, but, you know, you could also conceivably hire an individual guide on the mountain or not do it uh, if you wanted somebody for summit day. I don't think that just because you want to go it alone uh, needs to be consistent with you have some sort of alpine philosophy that you have to be a minimalist or you have to save money or whatever. Uh, I just think that people that have, you know, that that need a high level of service, want a high level of service, they're getting a really low level of service from package trips. And if they start thinking about uh, these mountain trips as expeditions, which they should take an active role in organizing, they can save themselves a lot of time and money in the long run because if you you only have a 38% chance of summiting or a 50% a chance of summiting uh, with these guided expeditions because the weather is bad 50% of the time or 30% of the time, you're just not going to be able to summit because the acclimatization schedule is not okay for you, that you have to go up when you've got headaches and you've got vomiting. That's not good, right? You know, if you start getting headaches, you should be slowing down at base camp, but these these package trips are not giving you that option. They're saying, if you're not performing on our schedule, you're not gonna get to summit ever, right? And that's a tremendous amount of pressure to put on to someone who's paid a lot of money uh, and you know, could have paid for it with the same money, could have paid for uh, an expedition that they uh, organize themselves. All right, subscribe to the Slow Boat Sailing channel. I'm Linus Wilson. Check out our videos about uh, Pico Orizaba, La Malinche, how to get Whitney permits when they're all gone. Bye-bye.